thank you uh, all for being here. Welcome to the Lyceum and to our first, uh, to the Partnership for Strong Communities first I form of 2024, highlighting rental voucher strategies across states. My name is Chelsea Ross. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. I'm so pleased to have you here with us today. If you've been here before, we have some gendered restrooms uh, to the right of the stage, these stairs. Don't worry, nobody can hear anything, even though it's on the stage, it's a little anxiety producing. Uh, we also have a non-gendered uh, restroom and the rear right of the Lyceum. Um, hopefully you found coffee and tea in the um, other conference space. Please take breaks as you need. Um, that space, if you need to take a phone call, if you sort of go to the back of the room, it is an open uh, ceiling, but uh, take breaks as you need them. You'll have some opportunities to join in on the conversation here in the room today, but you can also join us across all of our social platforms at hashtag iForum24. Uh, well, I think also we have somebody live tweeting the event so you can follow along. And CTN is joining us today live streaming. Thank you, CTN. And we'll make the recording of the event available to you if you'd like to share with other folks or revisit it. In just a moment, I'm gonna invite Dr. Shante Hanks from the Connecticut Department of Housing to provide some opening remarks for us. And we're very pleased to welcome Lindsay Duvall, who's gonna share and answer some questions on a comprehensive national rental housing program database. After that, we have a distinguished panel of state leaders from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, who are gonna discuss their state rental assistance programs, impact, challenges, funding, and of course, opportunities. We're super excited to uh, facilitate the exchange of best practices across states. We'll take a short break around 11.30, but please take one whenever you need it. And we'll reconvene and round out our morning with a presentation from a team of Massachusetts leaders and practitioners who have examined the power, potential, and challenges of a universal housing assistance program. And we'll close out at 12.30 with some opportunities to keep the conversation going and of course some invitations to action. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the team here at the Partnership for Strong Communities that made this forum and all of our work possible. First and foremost, Alicia Gardner, who is just walking in in the back, our senior policy analyst, who led the uh, development and execution of today's forum. A quick round of applause, please, for Alicia. And thank you also to Danielle Hubley, Carlene Sharmelis, Sean Gio, um, Jane Peters, our administrative director, and Emily, who's probably downstairs, you might have met at reception, is our intern this year from the Yukon School of Public Policy. I also wanna thank our panelists, some of you came from other states to be here, which is wonderful, not just on Zoom, so thank you so much in advance. I'd like to thank John Cabral and the Connecticut Project for partnering with us in this work and supporting us, and I'd like to thank each of you for taking your time to be here this morning, especially those of you who made a donation with your registration. Um, we really work hard to provide events uh, here at the Lyceum and at the Partnership for free, and your donations offset the cost of our events. If you, uh, after today, wanna make a donation, you can find that on our website. So at the Partnership for Strong Communities, we shape solutions to housing issues in Connecticut. We envision a future where everyone has access to safe, affordable home in a community of their choice. We're here for housing equity, justice, and access. We've been around for 25 years now, and if you've been around for a bit, you might notice that our look has changed recently, but our mission and our approach hasn't. We are advocates and policy experts. We engage in smart policy design and strategic civic and political advocacy to expand housing opportunity. We serve as researchers and a resource. We produce valuable materials to inform policies, empower communities, and foster a deep understanding of affordable housing challenges and solutions. And we're conveners. We serve as a hub of knowledge and collaboration, and we create spaces for shared insight and collective action. Our mission is carried out through partnership, it's in our name. We're committed to policies and practices that reduce disparities in housing and within our organization. We ground our work in facts and data and we prioritize housing solutions that are affordable and sustainable in the long term. Our guiding principle is that housing is a human right. We work to impact change across the housing stability continuum. As a result of our work, fewer people should be experiencing being unhoused, um, unstably housed, living in temporary, unaffordable housing or unsafe housing conditions, and that everyone should have access to non-time limited affordable housing in safe, healthy, and thriving neighborhoods. 
So how do we realize that vision? A healthy housing system uh, necessitates a comprehensive approach that intertwines housing affordability, creation, choice, and stability. People need to afford their homes while meeting their basic needs. We need more physical homes here in Connecticut, period. We need different types of homes for people to choose from in all communities across our state. And people should have the right to safe, stable housing and be protected from housing instability, eviction, and homelessness. This is how we weave a housing system that prioritizes the needs of our residents and that supports strong families and strong communities. So next week, the 2024 Connecticut Legislative Session kicks off, and the partnership is calling for key incremental policy changes that support affordability, creation, choice, and stability. You have a copy of our legislative priorities in your packet and your seat, in addition to preserving critical affordable housing bond authorizations, a change that would require greater that would <clears throat> require greater transparency on municipal land use decisions and necessary expansion of just cause eviction protections. We're asking our leaders to preserve, expand, and improve, improve Connecticut's rental assistance program. In Connecticut and across our country, rental assistance through housing vouchers play a vital role in addressing complex challenges of affordability, accessibility, and stability. Vouchers bridge the gap between the cost of housing and what low-income families can afford. The market is not naturally producing enough affordable housing. Vouchers are a mechanism to make up for this shortfall and create affordability in new and existing housing stock. Vouchers are essential for supporting vulnerable populations like our seniors, those with disabilities, and they're an essential tool to ending people's experience of homelessness, and an intervention for families on the brink of homelessness. Vouchers have the potential to support desegregation, opening access to high opportunity communities to families with limited financial resources. I could go on. But instead, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Shante Hanks, Senior Advisor for Education and Housing Stability and Director of Head Start on Housing from the Connecticut Department of Housing, who will share a little bit about how the Connecticut State Rental Assistance Program has been crucial to her work in addressing affordability in our state. Please welcome Dr. Hanks. Good morning, thank you, Chelsea. So I'm here to give remarks on behalf of uh, Commissioner Mascara Bruno that's unable to attend this morning, but I'm going to steal some of that time to talk about our program Head Start on Housing. I hope you don't mind. So good morning. All right, remarks out of the way. And uh, so let's go into Head Start on Housing. Um, something Chelsea said resonated with me when she talked about housing is a human right. I always speak first about Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs and how housing is that foundation, right? If a child is leaving an unstable home, how can they excel in school academically? There is, an, and I don't want to steal too much time, but, because I'm on borrowed time right now, I understand, but there is a poem that a young student wrote in Baltimore regarding a pencil. And it talks about, his name was Joshua, and it talks about what he went through before even making it into school. How he had to get his younger sister up, get her dressed, get them fed, and get them to school. And the teacher is harping on him about not having a pencil. And of course, his words are so profound. But I share that story because that's what many of our children are dealing with. And when they're passing, you know, their, their community, the streets, their neighbors on their way to school, they're exposed to violence. They're exposed to, um, you know, seeing so many things, so much trauma. And Head Start on Housing was the Department of Housing, Department of Education, and Office of Early Childhood's answer to preparing our students at their youngest ages. And actually, we have moms that are still uh, carrying, that have not even given birth, that are able to sign up with Early Head Start, and we can prepare to give them vouchers so that the child is not born into homelessness, so they're not born into an unstable housing environment. So the work that we do is, is, is critical. And 
I, I say this um, proudly, but also very concerning that Connecticut is the only state that has this program. We're the first. Uh, we will not be the last because what we do also find time to do is go and talk to other states, whether it be virtually or in person, because I know you all are familiar with uh, Dr. King's quote of one of many is that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So even though Connecticut is the first, we don't mind being the pioneers, but we want to make sure that Head Start on housing is throughout the country because this is an issue for our society. So I say that to say, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Head Start on housing? Okay. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I'm not preaching to the choir and, and folks un, uh, are learning about this today. So Head Start on Housing is, it started out as a pilot program here in Connecticut, and it was through the um, innovation of the Office of Early Childhood as well as the Department of Housing where they partnered together. We set aside wrap vouchers initially during our pilot uh, to house, to permanently house families that were experiencing homelessness that have children in early Head Start or Head Start, so that's zero to six. The pilot program, um, thanks to our initial team with Steve Delella from the Department of Housing and one of our trusted partners, I, I believe they're in the room, J.D. Uh, Milia and Associates, I see Michelle back there, and Michelle, I can see you even without my glasses, so that's saying something. Um, they are, are really those that started this program, drew up the blueprint, and now we're here today. It's just a full program, and we're doing really well and to, to the point that we transitioned into HGV vouchers. But we used our state resources to fund the program initially. And it was because of this group and the work that they did on the ground and also the work of our, our trusted contractor and partner, Jay D'Amelio, to get those applications processed that we saw that this is something that we could do and that we should do and we should also help other states replicate this program. So how this works is that we partner with Head Start on Housing um, awardees, I'm sorry, Head Start awardees, and they become partners of Head Start on Housing. Connecticut has 23 awardees throughout the state However, each awardee may have multiple locations of Head Start. For example, Alliance may have six to eight locations, but overall there's 23 awardees in the state. Currently we have 19 of those 23 partnered with our program, and that is amazing considering this program is just a year and a half old. So what that means is we have trained ECHO leads. These are folks that have been identified at each Head Start location as our liaison to work with us. They refer families that are experiencing unstable housing. Now, we have the luxury of being able to use both definitions, HUD's definition of homelessness, but also the McKinney-Vento definition, which, is a, which allows us um, to expand our net much wider. So families that are doubled up, families that um, have unstable housing that are living with other family members but that child doesn't necessarily have a room and a place to call their own, we can also help those families because that is unstable housing. Imagine the impact that that makes on a child. And again, when you're trying to focus, I remember growing up, I was always told, all you have to do is go to school. That's all you have to do. Many of our children, they have so much more responsibility than just going to school. And so we want to help them with that and, and erase that burden for them and their families. So with the Head Start on Housing program, we're able to do that. We work with the Head Start um, liaisons. And what, what's wonderful about working with Head Start is for those of you that are familiar with Head Start and their principles and their mission, they provide services and resources for the families as well. And it's funny, I'm sure you've always heard, you know, let a child lead you. That is exactly what this program does because it is the child that we are giving that voucher to to help their families. And what we love is when we can feed two birds with one seed and that there are oftentimes families that have multiple children that may be in K through 12. We're also helping them as well, but it is that youngest child that's zero to six years old that has allowed that family to receive this voucher. So how many of you in the room are investors, have you know properties in which you rent or what have you? 
So I won't ask you for money, so don't be scared. But I will ask you for your keys. And I say that to say, one of the things that we have found is a challenge is that we have to recruit more landlords and more realtors. Because as you can imagine, the families that we're helping, they um, don't have stellar credit. They don't have that perfect credit score. And they may have other issues that they're bringing to the table, obviously, because you would not be in shelter sleeping in a car or uh, couch surfing if you had all of your financial ducks in a row, so to speak. So with that being said, we appeal to landlords, we appeal to realtors to work with us because we're competing, as Chelsea mentioned, we have a shortage of, of rental units, affordable units, so we're competing with those that have those stellar credit scores or paying cash. So we try to build that partnership so that those landlords will understand that these families are coming with the power of three state agencies, the Department of Housing, the Department of Education, as well as the Office of Early Childhood, and that is worth far more than an 800 credit score. So I ask you to not only help us get that word out, but also if you have units that are, are vacant or will soon to be vacant, I mean, we're going as far as six months out to know that this unit will become available because we know that this work will continue to need to be done. That's why you're here today. So with that being said, um, please go to our website, um, Head Start on Housing CT dot com. You can also go to uh, the Office of Early Childhood's website and be linked to our website. You, my contact information is there. I will be here during the break to answer any questions you may have. Um, I love questions, so please don't hesitate to ask, um, because normally we do a, a, at least a 20-minute presentation, PowerPoint, questions, what have you, but I'm actually um, using opening remarks to talk to you about this program. There are other programs at the Department of Housing, as Chelsea alluded to, but I'm going to leave that to my trusted colleague, Steve DeLella, that will be sharing with you shortly during the panel discussion, and he will talk about those programs. But one I will mention is Time to Own. One of the things that I absolutely love about this program and one of the first questions that I ask, because I get this question also from the audience oftentimes when we're talking, is how long do they get to have these vouchers? Meaning when the children are out of grade school or what have you, is there like a, a sunset or kill date on that? There is not. We transition from RAP. We use all of our RAP vouchers to start the program, and then we went into HCV vouchers, commonly known as Section 8. The advantage to that, one, is it, it, it shows the success of the program that we, were, that we needed to move into those vouchers, but also the FSS program. Because one of my first questions when asked to take on this responsibility was, then what? I know for many families, getting a uh, HCV is like hitting the lottery, and I understand that. But my question was, what's to motivate them to do in, in, to more? What's wonderful about this role that I'm in is that it marries my two loves, passions, and areas of expertise, which is education and housing. So my concern was, but what about the parents, the families? After that, then what? What I love about the Section 8 voucher is that they can now be a part of the FSS program. And amongst other things, we can help them become first-time homeowners. And that's important because that also... Um, builds generational wealth. It also um, gives you that pride and ownership, and that's something that also changes the lives of, of the families. So I love talking about that aspect, and so I wanted to mention Time to Own, which is our program through CHAFA, in which we provide down payment assistance. So you have that coupled with, at least that's my, my um, long and short term goal of this program, coupled with the FSS program where we help these families become first time homeowners. So it's not that for them hitting the lottery is getting that voucher, getting that permanent housing, but to me it's, it's, it's far greater than that. I'm thinking long term for these families. Um, Chelsea, do I have a minute? How much time do I have? Okay, so that was nice. That was so sweet. If you could wrap up, that would be great. <laughs> the reason why I ask is because I, I could see your faces, at least the ones that I can see, 
um, that you have questions. But again, I will be here during the break to answer any questions you may have, and you can also reach out to me. Um, my contact information is on the website. And again, um, your keys. I need your keys. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hanks. I think we're gonna be fighting the clock all morning because there's so much information to share and, and so much great conversation. Um, so let's start at the national level. Uh, national Low Income Housing Coalition created the Rental Housing Programs Database to support understanding the diverse ways in which state and local governments use their own financial resources to close the gap between available federal funding for rental housing and the unmet needs of renters in their communities. Um, Partnership for Strong Communities is super excited to welcome Lindsay Duvall, Senior Housing Advocacy Organizer from National Low Income Housing Coalition to hear more. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks, Chelsea. Great to be with you all today. Um, I'm gonna keep my remarks short and thank you so much for you know, opening and grounding us and why we're all doing this work and we'll wanna do it um, more and better. Um, so, but yeah, we're gonna zoom out to the national level um, and talk about our new rental housing programs database. Um, I'm not a research analyst, so I just want to be upfront about that. Um, I'm an advocate. Uh, that's what NLHC does. We connect with advocates across the country and really mobilize them. So I'm going to talk about this database and give you a little tutorial, but I'll end with a call to action. So just going to prepare you for that. Uh, so we are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan policy advocacy and research organization based in Washington, D.C. I always like to start with our mission statement because what really sets us apart and really drives our policy priorities is that we're focused on renters with the lowest, people with the lowest incomes. Um, and it's important to just kind of understand where we're coming from with all the work that we do. And again, while our... Um, our policy priorities are all focused at the federal level. We recognize that Congress is just not doing enough. And so states and localities are chipping away at the housing crisis in various ways. Uh, and that brings us to this database. So um, as Chelsea mentioned, we're trying to collect information on state and locally funded programs that create, preserve, or increase access to affordable rental housing. You can link to it using the QR code here or typing in um, the link in your browser. Uh, basically, we're looking at four and any combination of these different types of programs in the database. So tenant-based rental assistance, project-based assistance, tenant tax relief programs. Those are programs that offer a state or local tax credit or refunds that goes directly to an eligible tenant or, or the owner of the rental unit in exchange for reducing the tenant's rent. There's a lot of technical stuff in this database, so forgive me that I just have to read some of these slides to you. Um, then we're also looking at capital resources for housing development, as well as any combination um, of assistance here. Notably, the database does not include programs that are funded just with federal funds, so housing choice vouchers, home emergency solutions, grants, um, the ER, Treasury ERA program, they're not gonna be included in here. And then we're also not including landlord relief or reimbursement type programs or local, or excuse me, land banks or land trusts. Um, so we think you know, this can be a resource for advocates and policymakers. Um, and I'm glad that we'll have some of them in the program administrators in the room to talk more about how it actually works. In terms of the methodology, so some form of the database has been in existence since 2001. Um, we recently updated it in the fall with support from partners at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And we started with kind of a state uh, level review of rental housing programs in every state and the District of Columbia. And then we added in uh, the top 50 US cities by population and then included the largest city in any state that didn't already have a top 50 city. So we have some geographic diversity in the database. 
Um, and we just started out with basic internet research on these programs, what was available online, and then we sent a survey out to program administrators to try to collect more information. So I know I have at least one survey taker in the room. Anyone else fill out NLHC survey? Um, I know there's some people from other states here. So just really thank you for doing that um, and helping us you know, make this resource available and really useful. Um, so for programs that didn't respond to the survey, we just did additional um, internet research to try to fill in as much as, as possible. And I really have to shout out our research analyst, Sarah Abdelhadi, who spearheaded this at NLHC and put some of the slides together for me. I'm happy to field questions for her and probably connect you to her for any um, specifics. Um, and then I also need to note that it's not a live database. We don't have the capacity to keep this updated in real time, and historically we've updated it about once every five years. So it's fresh now. So um, again, here's the QR code to link to the database. When you get to the page, you'll land on a map of the continental US, and you can start by just clicking on a state and pulling up a list of the rental housing programs we found within it. And then you can scroll down a little bit farther into the search bar to start to filter what criteria you want to look for. So you can filter by state, by type of program. Again, that's tenant-based rental assistance, capital, project-based, the tenant tax relief, or a combination. Um, you can filter by income eligibility, and this tab has 29 different categories. So we have a range of different area median income categories. We also have the ability to search by, um, you know, special criteria or an actual dollar amount in there. Um, and then we also have a search bar for keywords like homeless or youth programs. Uh, so once you get some of your, you know, filters that you want to look at, um, that your, you know, populations you're curious about, one unique feature of the database is um, you can copy the hyperlink and keep the search, you know, the filtering you've done live in that hyperlink, which doesn't exist on a lot of other databases. So that just makes this information kind of easy to share as you're working through it. And then, of course, um, well, you can click on the hyperlink of any of these programs to pull up uh, a summary. Um, I pulled up the Connecticut RAP program here, so you get, you know, who's administering it, a little summary, and then all the data we were able to collect about it. Again, shout out to anyone who filled in our, um, our survey to get us that data, as well as a link to the website to learn more. Um, but then, you know, if you're looking at a range of programs that you've pulled up by different search criteria, you have the ability to download an Excel, data, um, an Excel spreadsheet so that you can further sort and, and search by different, um, you know, criteria or categories. So when in, for one example, you can sort by the total funding to see which program spends the most on tenant-based rental assistance. Does anyone want to guess? what state has the program that spends the most on tenant-based rental assistance? Not Connecticut. Massachusetts is a very close second. It's a great guess. California, yeah. And again, that's with the limited data we were able to find. Um, funding for these programs, you know, comes from not just state budgets, but a variety of different sources and comes in at different times. Um, but that's what we, you know, I was able to find from that. So it has information like that in it. So along with updating the database, we released a report. Uh, so I'll go through some of the overall findings there. Um, in total, we identified 353 active programs that met our methodology criteria, and that's nearly double the number of programs that we found about 10 years ago. So it's de this, these states and local solutions are definitely growing. Um, we notably didn't find a single program at the state or largest city level in Arkansas or Wyoming. Um, we have advocates in those states, and we're always working with them to push for solutions there but um, they are unfortunately not included. 
If you see something missing, you can feel free to let us know. We just can't guarantee that we'll be able to include it in this, in this um, update. So California has the largest total number of programs. There are 21 programs there. Massachusetts was very close at 18 programs, and, and Minnesota actually tied at 18 total programs. In terms of the type of programs we identified, capital resources were the most common type of program. Um, we found at least one program that provides capital assistance in every state in the District of Columbia. 55% um, of all the programs in the database provide capital assistance. We did identify 133 total programs that provide some form of rental assistance, so about 38% of all the programs in the database, and we found those across 18 states and in 17 cities. So I'll dive into a little bit about just rental assistance programs as the topic today. So of all the programs that provided rental assistance, 70, over 70% 70 provide only tenant-based rental assistance, and 18% provided only project-based assistance. There were a handful that do some combination of both, and the Minnesota Housing Trust Fund is an example of that. Um, but by and large, it was either tenant-based or project-based. Um, of the, so over 80% of the project-based rental assistance programs provide assistance for more than two years or have no predetermined time limit. So they're providing a longer term of assistance, but it's a smaller portion of the programs that are out there. Meanwhile, more than half of all the tenant-based rental assistance programs provide assistance for less than two years. And so it's important to note that although shorter term assistance is very helpful and can certainly help a household who's experiencing some kind of unexpected financial crisis, it's not going to solve the rental bur you know, cost burden or challenges for a household that's living on a fixed income, maybe someone who's a senior citizen or living with a disability. Um, that's when you really do need the longer term rental assistance. We found that nearly all tenant-based um, programs pay rental assistance directly to a landlord or other approved vendor. That's not surprising, but we did find five programs that only pay directly to tenants and two that pay to a tenant if the housing provider is unable or unwilling to participate. Um, oh, and I did see a little note there about... Um, Three-fourths of programs allow rental assistance to be used for security deposits and relocation, um, and 37% cover utility payments. So just a, you know, lots of data. I'm happy to um, share more about the report. So most of the programs we found use income eligibility thresholds to assess applicants. 23% um, require households to be at or below 50% of the area median income, so that was very common. Roughly two-thirds of programs include the criteria of experiencing or being at risk of homelessness, and 40% of those use this criteria to help prioritize their applicants, so that was very common. Um, a handful of programs have some restrictions based on a renter's eviction record, um, rent payment history, or criminal record. It's a small amount, and we suspect that there's a lot more programs that just don't explicitly call this out in public documents, but still use that to screen out applicants. Notably, half of all the programs we looked at allow tenants to self-attest to their income, which um, can greatly reduce the barriers to accessing rental assistance funds. So we want to call that out. So how can you use the rental assistance program, a rental housing program database? Um, we think advocates can use this to identify programs offered in similar or neighboring states and learn what works and what doesn't. Um, push to bring these solutions home, that's kind of what we're doing today. Policymakers maybe can look at some of the different, um, you know, types of assistance out there, what levers they can pull to fine tune programs to serve certain populations, how they're being funded and at what levels. And individuals and service providers can even use it um, to connect with programs that can provide them direct, uh, direct housing assistance. But one important factor that we're not able to capture with the database 
is the program impact or the number of people served. So we do try to include, as I said, some funding data, um, but it's really difficult and it's inconsistently reported. Um, so, you know, some of, some of that piece might not be as reliable and going directly to the program itself or to advocates in that region to better understand it is gonna serve you well. Um, one way that you could use the database is to find other states that have similar housing needs or other characteristics and see what assistance they're offering at a state level. We have a broad network across the country and would be happy to try to connect you with advocates and certainly you can use the database to go straight to program websites um, and hopefully get more information about those. And then I've listed some data points here as a starting point for what you might consider searching other you know, neighboring states or states that have a similar, you know, we track a couple big um, research points in every state and often at a, at a local level too. The number of uh, affordable homes for per 100 extremely low income renter households. We produce a, a report every year that shows some of those numbers. Um, and how low they are, you know, in Connecticut only, and I think Chelsea mentioned that only 37 homes are available and affordable for every 100 extremely low income renter households, um, as well as the housing wage. So what you actually have to earn an hour working full time to afford the wage in that state on an, on an average level. And again, we have that at a local level too. So there's a couple ideas. All of this data is available on our websites. It's free and available and we want people to use it. You can search the housing needs by state to get to it. And I did bring a couple copies of our research reports here. They're very pretty and I'm happy to give them away to people that can really make use of them. So the rental housing program database shows that states and cities are really stepping up and doing a great job of providing assistance. But the fact is no state is getting it right. Um, no state is adequately f meeting the needs of its renters and especially the lowest income renters. Our annual gap report shows kind of which states have the biggest gap in affordable units per the, the low, extremely low income renters there, which are the states listed in red here. Um, it's really not a matter of who's, you know, it's maybe who's doing it better than others. And I think that's what we're here to learn about um, with the panel. So this is why NLHC continues to push Congress to play a greater role. And we have outlined four key solutions um, to addressing the housing crisis. The first to bridge the gap between incomes and housing costs by expanding rental assistance. The second to expand and preserve the supply of, of affordable and accessible homes. The third is to provide emergency rental assistance to households who are in a crisis. And the last is to strengthen and enforce renter protections. And here's the call to action. So there's many ways to get involved with NLIHC. Uh, you can use this QR code to get to our Take Action page where you can quickly and easily send messages to your members of Congress about our policy priorities. Right now, it's really vital that we're all speaking up to prevent potential harmful budget cuts um, as, the, as the budget gets finalized in Congress. Um, and then we're also encouraged to see some bipartisan housing legislation moving forward this year, including the Eviction Crisis Act and the Family Stability and Opportunities Vouchers Act. Um, happy to answer questions about that when, when there's time, but also happy to, to step away and not take any difficult questions about this database that I'm not, you know, wasn't involved in creating. So I'll let you decide, Chelsea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Larissa and I'm from West Incarcerated Anonymous. And I want to know if your database and your advocacy includes rights for people who have criminal backgrounds, given that HUD passed the law saying you can no longer discriminate. Yeah, advocacy, absolutely. Yeah, we have a whole working group and um, focus on, um, you know, housing for returning citizens and reentry, et cetera. So absolutely, always advocating for that population because they face some serious barriers to 
to seeking housing. Um, I had one little statistic about the number of programs we found that explicitly um, you know, deny or restrict eligibility by some of those qualifications. Um, so, you know, we, it is a data point we were interested in looking at, and I can see if there were any other trends along that line. Um, it, you, it might also be one of those kind of key words you could search for, um, but if you're looking, for instance, for like a model program that provides vouchers for that population, <laughs> we can talk maybe in the break. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, my name is Giselle Chavez. I'm the housing organizer with Make the Road Connecticut. Um, in this database, is the undocumented um, families included? Yeah, so we did take a look at that. And I, did, I brought the full 20-page report about the database here, too. Um, so I know there's a point in here about the number of programs that restrict or require proof of citizenship or something like that. So if you allow me time in the break, I can look that point up for you. Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't so hard, thank you. Um, like I said, I have some resources here, I'm happy to share those, but thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to learning more about how these programs actually work in the, in the panel. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. We really appreciate you coming in and sharing that database. I know um, here at the partnership, we love the database. We were working on it over the summer, and then when they re-released the updated version in November, we were very excited. Um, as a matter of fact, the database was really a crucial kind of kickstart to us having the program today, because with the database, we were able to look and see what are some of those long-term rental assistance programs? What are the ones that last longer than two years that are there to help people where they're at as long as they need it instead of just a temporary Band-Aid? Um, and we were able to look around and see we have some great neighboring states that are doing very similar things to what Connecticut has with their rental assistance program. We have Massachusetts with um, their MVRP program, which is a long-term rental assistance program that's modeled in part after the, the Section 8 voucher program as well. We have the New Jersey State Rental Assistance Program. Um, we have Illinois and Hawaii that also have these, but unfortunately we're not able to bring any representatives from them here to Connecticut. Um, though never off the table, you know, to go take a trip and see what is Hawaii doing? Is it effective? Can we ask them? Um, but with that, I would like to introduce our regional panel and ask them to come on up. Um, and we're going to welcome representatives from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey's Housing Executive Branch Agencies for a regional panel on state-funded voucher programs. They've traveled far and wide to participate today, and we're very grateful for that. Um, so I'll let you come on up. I'll give you my mic <laughs> um, when we're done. There's also a, there's a chair here as well. Um, but yes, I would like to introduce Steve Delella, who's the Director of Individual and Family Support Program Unit here at Connecticut's own Department of Housing. Um, Janelle Winter, the Assistant Commissioner of the Division of Housing and Community Resources at the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs and Cecilia Woodworth, the Assistant Director of State Programs, Division of Rental Assistance with the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. We're also thrilled to welcome Christy Staples back to the partnership, um, who's formerly here as an Executive Deputy Executive Director and now works as the VP of Policy and Government Relations at the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Um, you should have the bio sheets. You can learn more about our distinguished panel members, and we'll just kick it right off. Thank you. 
Thanks, Alicia. Good morning, everyone. This is really exciting. And we have a wonderful panel, and I think we're going to jump right in. So thank you, Lindsay, for giving us the high-level overview of the data, the dashboard, and what you're collecting. And now we're going to have some real live examples of what we're seeing on the ground. So we're going to dive in here. Um, let's start with Cecilia. OK. Um, what I'd like uh, for each of us to, to sort of open up with is tell us a little bit about the program um, that Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Connecticut, respectively, uh, are all running, and um, what you see as some of the unique benefits of the program. Sure. Can you, can you hear me? Back here. Um, so MRVP, the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program, is, like Christy said, a lot like Section 8. Um, in January, we had 9,600 vouchers leased, about 5,800 mobile vouchers, and 3,800 project-based vouchers, so we do do both. Um, over the past decade, the program has been growing by leaps and bounds, um, so we are lucky enough to have more funding than we know what to do with most years, um, so we have been making some important policy changes over the past couple of years, undoing some previous budget cuts that happened. Um, we moved to a payment standard model. All of our folks are paying 30% of their income in rent now. We are moving to small area FMRs next month, hopefully giving folks more opportunity to live in high opportunity areas. Um, and we give our Division of Housing Development hundreds of project-based vouchers that they can award every year to help create net new housing with which Massachusetts desperately needs and also to create deeply subsidized units for folks across Massachusetts. Um, some of the unique benefits of our program, um, there's a question about immigration status. Because we are a state program, none of our programs verify immigration status. Um, so unlike the federal programs, it, that piece is not an issue. Um, and we also have a lot of flexibility. We are not connected to HUD or any other vouchers. Our budget fully comes from the state. And so we have the ability to somewhat quickly meet needs um, as they arise across the state um, and have the flexibility to address some of the other needs that we have. Great. Thank you, Cecilia. Janelle, I'll turn it over to New Jersey's program. Thank you. Uh, in New Jersey, we have two major state-funded rental assistance programs, the State Rental Assistance Program, which we call SRAP, and the Supportive Housing Connection. Between the two programs, the annual budget is about $125 million, and we're serving about 17,000 households. Uh, those are administered by the Department of Community Affairs, and we at DCA are also the state's uh, public housing authority for HUD. So our Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program uh, serves about 25,000 households. So we actually um, administer these programs with state staff. So we have about 110 state staff working on these programs, uh, both at central office and then at 13 field offices across the state. Uh, SRAP is a program that is basically very much modeled after Section 8, as I think we'll hear a lot about these programs. Uh, it is divided, there are four buckets of funding, essentially. Uh, funding that's dedicated for seniors, for people leaving homelessness, for people with disabilities, and then what we refer to as the family program, which is basically, it is just, that is just income eligibility. So anyone can, can be a part of that program. Uh, the AMI level is 50% AMI, but the majority of folks we see are lower than that. And the majority of the vouchers are tenant-based, although we have about close to 1,000 project-based in that program. Uh, the second program is the Supportive Housing Connection, uh, the SHC. And this is a program that we administer in conjunction with our Department of Human Services. And it was established uh, several years ago when our DHS went from a model where kind of services and housing were bundled together in contracts 
to separating it out so that services are Medicaid billable and now the housing payments are structured after housing subsidies and so also the recipients of those are in lease based housing in which they have the rights and responsibilities of tenants and so they have a higher level of independence and of you know tenants rights than they did before and folks for that housing are referred directly by DHS and they are either folks who are receiving services through the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services or through the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, and then finally, we have a portion of our SRAP program that is dedicated to our pilot programs. And right now we have four pilots running. We have a pilot called Keeping Families Together in conjunction with our Department of Children and Families, which focuses on child welfare involved families and reunification. Another program with DCF that focuses on pregnant and parent parenting young adults. We have a program that focuses on um, uh, people who are pregnant or have just had children and you know, providing vouchers for them. And then we have a program in, conjun in conjunction with DHS where we're focused on extremely low income people who are receiving benefits. And I think, you know, one of the great benefits, of course, of state funded programs and ours are funded, the majority are state budget appropriations annually, but a portion comes from our state affordable housing trust fund, is flexibility, is an ability to respond very quickly to issues that come up. We can say, hey, here is an issue. Here are folks who really need housing in this area. What can we do to provide that? I think another benefit of our programs is that because they are co-located and administered by our staff in our housing programs, we are able to have a lot of overlap, um, not overlap, but we are able to leverage the various programs that we provide so people can take advantage of them. So for instance, because we have our housing production funds in-house at the division, we can think about how we marry those with uh, rental voucher assistance because we have our homelessness prevention programs in the same, uh, you know, in the same program, we are able to match up needs there. So for instance, when we most recently did a waiting list opening, we timed it with the point in time count of the homeless. So that when people going out to count people who were homeless were doing that, they brought with them tablets and they were able to sign people up for the uh, waiting list lottery at the same time as they did that. And so as a result, uh, and we also instituted a preference for people who are homeless in that lottery opening. So as a result, we saw the largest number of people who were homeless who were accepted into the, onto the waiting list than we ever have had in the past. And so that was because the staff working in both of those programs are colleagues and work together and were able to make sure that we did those things together. So I think that's one of the benefits of the way we do it in New Jersey at least. Incredible. Thank you, Janelle. Steve, let's hear about Connecticut's RAP program. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think I could just say ditto and kind of call it a day because <laughs> our programs are very, very similar to what is happening in Massachusetts and New Jersey. So here in Connecticut, we administer the program called the Rental Assistance Program, RAP for short, totally state funded. Uh, right now, we have approximately 6,700, Michelle, about 6,700 uh, households that uh, we serve. Uh, unlike New Jersey, we subcontract out to an organization called John to Million Associates who manages our rental assistance program and they do it very, very well. So we appreciate the hard work that they do for us. Uh, very, very similar things. We also are a state housing authority. So we also do administer the Section 8 program, Housing Choice Vouchers. We have a little over 8,000 in that program as well when you include VASH and all of, oh, I'm getting the upward sign. So maybe closer to 9,000. Okay, closer to 9,000 when you uh, encompass all of our uh, additional programs like the VASH, the Emergency Housing Vouchers, uh, Main Street and all the uh, other ones that we do. But uh, the, the main point about the RAP is totally the flexibility. And that is something that we've seen over the course of time. Um, I don't know if it makes us move any quicker, uh, but certainly the ability to house different populations is very, very key. Uh, when I look at our expenditure report, the, the number of uh, silos or buckets that we have is very, very large. Uh, we do have just a traditional program, which may be a little bit different than here with my colleagues, because that is actually the smallest percentage of any of these kind of like specialty programs. Only 
only about 1,600 or so of our overall total goes to a traditional uh, uh, RAP program, which really mirrors the, the, the housing choice voucher, which is just about income eligibility. Everything else we do in Connecticut is considered more or less a specialty program. We do have a, a lot of vouchers for the homeless population. Uh, which is both project-based as well as scattered site, tenant-based. Uh, so we're able to provide different opportunities. And likewise, we have been able to match uh, some of our wrap subsidies to either low-income housing tax credit projects or standalone rounds that we've had with the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority that provided the capital and our Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services that provided the, the services to kind of create that permanent supportive housing. But we've also been able to do programs with our Department of Social Services, specifically the Money Follows the Person program, uh, where we're taking people directly out of nursing homes and placing them in their own units out in the community because we know that living independently is not only the right thing to do, it can actually also be a little bit more cost effective than paying 200, well this was the rate, I'm sure it's up, $257 uh, a day to stay in a nursing home. Uh, so clearly we can have the added benefit of having people living independently at a more reasonable cost so we can actually help more individuals. We've also been able to partner with our Department of Corrections as well as our uh, judicial branch with those folks on probation to create a, a, a permanent supportive housing program for folks that cycle between homelessness and the criminal justice system. Uh, I think that has been really a great model to really get at that uh, population that cycles between multiple systems. So once again, we're able to really look and see the population that uh, is going between different agencies and how we can actually provide one sort of solution and we can combine our resources. We can actually set people on a path to sustainability, stability, um, and just not really re-entering these higher cost system so it's really great there um, our homeless system is totally tied with our Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, we partner really well with them that's probably our longest standing partnership we've been doing that for over 25 years uh, that's where I actually came from uh, and it really is a great opportunity to take that mental health care and that case management provided to those people who may be struggling to really allow them to be stable in housing kind of address those issues before they get out of hand so we actually keep people stably housed. Um, the, the newest population that we've been able to go with is our Department of Developmental Services. They really have understood the great ability to move people out into the community. They've seen incredible results and they've really taken on that housing is really not only that basic right that, that Chelsea talked about, but it really is the best way to further people to, to thrive out in the community. So it's a little bit different with that because those are more project-based uh, because there certainly is the uh, having a community actually helps those people with IDD really thrive in those units. So we, we've been able to work collaboratively with our loan causing tax credits as well as state funded projects uh, really to create many of those and DDS has really been engaged and they keep pushing out more and more units and we're very, very excited about that. And I think one of the biggest things besides the flexibility is when I talk about all these partnerships with these other agencies, they've really started to understand the importance of housing. I think a lot of times when we worked with some of these agencies before, they just thought, oh, housing, that's not our responsibility, it's, you know, DOHs. However, when they start to see the benefits that it provides for the individuals that they serve, they really start buying into the model to the fact that even if our overall appropriation is about $75 million, DDS and DEMIS um, have been able to actually find money within their own budgets, and they say, we actually want more of that more than what the state has appropriated and we will find excess surplus dollars and we'll give it to you DOH to convert it into RAP subsidies and RAP certificates. So that has really been interesting and we love doing that because it just helps spread the wealth a little bit farther. Uh, so you know we're always uh, up to partner. Clearly you heard Dr. Hanks this morning uh, with the Head Start and Housing Program and that's another great part that I like about the RAP program is it really allows us the flexibility to try proof of concept and really to see what works. So anytime somebody comes to us and say, hey, what about this idea? What about this idea? We're like, sure. They're like, what about Section 8? I'm like, well, there's a lot of things that we have to do with Section 8. You know, we have to change our administrative plan. We have to go down certain uh, rules. We have to make sure we have public hearings and all that. Why don't we just try it with RAP? Why don't we just give 25 subsidies and see what happens? So we were able, that's how Head Start on Housing started and it was great. We also have another pilot called um, the Open Choice Program here in Connecticut. We have the Open Choice in Schools where um, families 
families that live in uh, inner cities have the opportunity to apply to have their children uh, commute to school out in the suburbs. Uh, but by doing this, we're actually able to, so once the families get engaged in those communities, they realize that their children, once they start getting older, have extracurricular, or even when they're younger, have extracurricular activities and they really become part of the community because when you go to school, that really is that community. So why not provide the voucher so that that household can move into the community in which their children go to school? It really is another, like at Southern Housing, a win-win. It makes a lot of sense. And that, that program has multiple benefits. Not only does that family have the benefit of moving to the community in which their children go to school, but also opens up another slot for the uh, Open Choice program so, we, so that Open Choice can actually help another family. So once again, when you see all this interagency collaborative, we're really working toward the same goals. We're really decreasing costs across different state agencies, and people are thriving and just being able to live more independently in the community, which just benefits the entire state. Amazing. Thank you all. That's really, I love that. I heard flexibility from all three states. That's exciting. Nimbleness, right? The ability to pivot. I love the New Jersey and Massachusetts examples of that integrations with the systems. That's really important. I know we're working on those important things in Massachusetts as well. Uh, given all of that and their systems integration and all of the hard work with innovation you're doing, I would imagine that since we're in a housing crisis, uh, their demand for vouchers uh, is really, really high. And so I'd be curious to hear from all of you, um, and I'm, I'll, I'll open up who wants to respond first, how you're dealing with that demand. Do you have wait lists? And if so, what do those wait lists look like? Are there any other uh, sort of uh, strategies that you're deploying to manage the demand? I imagine that everyone in the room is, is probably really curious to hear about that. So whoever wants to take it on first, uh, please jump in. So in Massachusetts for MRVP, we do have homeless priorities and we will do special issuances to target populations like homeless families. Um, but in general for our mobile vouchers, it's a giant wait list. We have over 90 agencies that issue mobile vouchers. Um, as little as six months ago to apply, you would have to fill out a paper application, send it to those 90 agencies, either in person, if the wait list was open, it was difficult to say the least. Um, in September, we moved into a centralized online application system so folks can apply for all of our mobile vouchers at once, also our state aid of public housing, and then another small voucher program in one central location. Um, and we also have a centralized agency that verifies our homeless priorities that apply to those mobile vouchers. Um, so that is exciting. What is not exciting is that we have probably 800 mobile vouchers right now that aren't being utilized, either they're not issued or our household is currently looking for a unit. And the last time I saw our wait list for MRVP was a, over 100,000 individual unique applicants. Um, so unfortunately, the demand far, far out exceeds what we have to offer. Um, we do have a strict homeless priority and that's one way to prioritize folks, but we are actively looking at if that is accurately targeting the most vulnerable um, citizens. Unfortunately, a lot of those folks on the wait list are in dire situations. I think the situation we see in New Jersey is very similar. Uh, we do maintain a waiting list. Uh, we maintain a waiting list of about the number of households we feel we'll be able to serve in approximately three years. So uh, about two years ago for SRAP, we opened a waiting list, uh, the general waiting list. Um, we have a centralized waiting list online, although of course we also, for people who can't access online, uh, take paper applications and we also actually had a, um, you know, a call center that would take them over the phone for folks and then entered into the lottery. And it's, you know, I think as we all feel, it is a shame and a tragedy that we have to talk about having a lottery for, a literal lottery for housing. Um, but that is, you know, unfortunately the situation that we're in. So we do see a waiting list. We do see a number of people who, you know, apply. The last time, the last waiting list we opened was actually our Section 8 waiting list. And in a three, week period when we were accepting applications for 15,000 slots on the waiting list, we saw over, you know, 150,000 applications for those slots. So the demand very much does outpace the supply. 
which I think actually speaks to one of the benefits when we talked about the benefits of rental assistance programs, uh, state funded, is simply increasing the supply of rental assistance. You know, it's great that we have, we can respond nimbly and we can design new programs, but in a lot of ways, the real struggle that we're facing is simply there are many more people who need these uh, vouchers than can be handled, certainly by the federal funding that's available. So any dollar we can assist uh, in, you know, increasing the supply that's available, that's more households that, that we can assist. So I think, you know, I think it's really important not to lose sight of that very basic benefit of the more dollars we have helping people afford housing, the more people stay under a roof. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the biggest challenges we see is that dramatic cost increase in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Just looking at our, our numbers, it was shocking to me when I uh, actually look back from two years ago, uh, July, or June, July of 2021 to June, July of 2023, the numbers just exploded that I've, in, in a way that I've never seen. So that's just gonna put added pressure uh, on our overall budget, meaning just the cost to maintain those same households is gonna cost us millions of dollars more uh, than it was in 2021. So that's gonna cause that added pressure. Um, and it, it, it certainly is difficult, and I think you saw that clearly from Chelsea and her opening remarks about some of the things that the, the partnership is advocating for. Now, in terms of wait lists, it's kind of interesting hearing my colleagues talk because yes, DOH does have a traditional wait list, but once again, that is really only for that traditional RAP program that really looks like a Section 8. Um, for those people that it's just about income eligibility. And to that fact, we've opened up our wait list twice in the past, since 2007, so what is that, 17 years now? Only twice, and we actually still have people on our wait list from that 2007 opening, just showing you how difficult it is to move people through. So I think we are trying to be intentional on how that wait list moves, but knowing that it really is a smaller percentage of our overall total. Now, the way that the RAP gets funded is the legislature provides the money for us, um, and every year if they want to expand the program, they kind of give us the details and the hints of the, what they want it to use for. So for example, in one year they may say, we're gonna give you a you know, million dollars, which will be approximately 100 vouchers for the homeless population. So we're like, okay, great. Or maybe they give us money for the Money Follows the Person or the DDS population or other Medicaid initiatives. So like, we always set those kind of aside, like I said, in our own silos. And then when we create those programs, they're actually those programs are the ones that create those who are eligible. So for example, those in the homeless service system, it all goes through a coordinating entry process. So there isn't a traditional lottery wait list, you know, we, we put those vouchers out, we assign them to each of the uh, seven coordinated entry networks, coordinated access networks, the CANs, here in the state, and then those entities kind of decide based on priority, based on vulnerability, who are the ones that are going to receive those when we get them. Same thing with the Money Follows the Person program. We work with our Department of Social Services. They're the, um, house, they're the ones identifying the individuals in the nursing homes that are ready to transition, and from there they make the eligibility decisions and then we, we kind of go, go with it on that. So it really is interesting because then we have these different ways to gain access based on the different type of programs, which I think is more effective and efficient, because I know when we try to do things with our, sorry Suzanne, you can close your ears. Sorry, when we do stuff through our, our Section 8 program, we do have to follow very similar rules and it becomes difficult to manage these separate populations when you have to go to the same rule and kind of put everybody onto the wait list and kind of how do you pick them off of that wait list when there's somebody above. So by having these, this, you know, these different uh, pots of funding, we're able to really you know, try to pinpoint those who would be best served with it. So I think that level of flexibility is really important. And that kind of cuts down on our wait list. Um, so th that's where we're worsening today. Yeah, I appreciate those answers. And I know we're all feeling that. So um, we are here to talk about ways that we can improve the system. And, and given that, uh, I know, Steve, that you had mentioned the annual budget and working with the legislature, and part of that is a really important hand in glove, glove advocacy that the partnership is doing to make sure that those resources are allocated appropriately. So I'm gonna to switch to something with more hope uh, and, and opportunity here. Uh, you've all three been implementing these programs for a while, and uh, would love to hear some of your strategies for improving efficiency, right? Given the barriers that we've identified, uh, how are you all seeing those pockets of uh, hope or strategies that are uh, uh, allowing for efficiency uh, in, within the programs? And again, um, Janelle, do you want to start? You want to, or sure. Cecilia's taken all the first ones, so we'll switch it around. Janelle. 
So I think one of the things that's really added to a lot of efficiency is partnerships with other state programs. So that, you know, instead of basically our lane at DCA, you know, in this area is housing. We run through Section 8, we run 25,000 vouchers a year, we, run, we know how to run vouchers. And so as our state agency partners, certainly DHS has been partnered for, with us for decades. As other of our partners, such as you know, Department of Children and Families, start to really engage with housing as a need and something that they need to um, provide for the people that they're serving, entering into those partnerships where they control the services and in a lot of ways they control kind of entrance into the program. You know, for instance, with DCF, they have a very, um, a very specific screening tool for entry into the program that we, that we run for them. But by, you know, with us kind of taking our, our staff and our expertise and leveraging that to administer the vouchers while they handle the, the services that they are experts in, you know, we can each take what we're doing and we can, um, you know, make that program more efficient. And I think the other benefit that really comes from that is by working so closely with each other in all of the, our kind of sister agencies, just in terms of running the housing programs, we learn a lot about what we need to do to be able to serve people who might be clients of those other agencies but are approaching us through our mainstream housing programs. You know, um, we don't, while we might have some programs that are tagged, this is a program, you know, a housing program specifically for people who are homeless referred by DMOS, we have many people in, you know, who just come to us through the regular lottery process, but who might have these backgrounds. Like what we learn is, you know, it, there's not their people and our people, they're, they're all of our people. And so we're able to, I think, make improvements in our mainstream programs based on what we see in the more unique kind of boutique programs. And the other thing we've learned is if we can make a program that works really well for people who are extremely low income, for people who have disabilities, for people who are the most vulnerable, every person benefits from it. You know, as an example, one of the things we've added in our programs that we started adding for folks who um, had disabilities, were returning from incarceration, or faced other barriers were first, um, or were coming in from homelessness, housing navigators to work on locating units, especially because people could face barriers because they don't have credit, they have some issues in their background. And we now have housing navigators in every one of our field offices working with everyone who's issued a voucher. And the same thing with our landlord incentive programs. We started working on those specifically for people who were literally homeless and have found that in order to you know, find enough people to, as was said earlier, give us their keys, we really need to provide landlord incentives for people who might not be in a specifically homeless program, but have that history and are coming through one of our mainstream programs. And so we're able to kind of, I think, bring some of those pilots to scale, and I think it improves the whole system. And I, I totally agree. I think the biggest the piece of this, like I, I've, I've spoken before, New Jersey just did there, is really just being able to work with your sister state agencies is really the best way to, to help out people who cycle between different systems because we know that housing is oftentimes what is the most key thing when you provide permanent and stable housing many other outcomes for our sister state agencies improve whether it's mental health whether it's recidivism whether it's education all those things improve when you have a place to call home so I think that is really what's important and that's what we continue to strive to do in Connecticut uh, my goal is to have some sort of relationship with almost every state agency I mean, we're even doing something with DOT and DMV. Maybe not with the subsidies, but we're, we're doing stuff with them, whether it's homeless outreach or getting, or getting um, IDs for the people that we're serving so that they can get into our Section 8 and our RAP programs a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. Now, obviously, we're always interested in trying to streamline the application process and the paperwork process as best as we can. So we're always looking for ideas on how to best do that. But at the same time, we have to be careful because we do have the Section 8 program. And what we don't want to do is create these programs that are too totally separate that it gets to the point where landlords start preferring one over the other because that can lead to other detrimental effects where all of a sudden if we are so 
if, you know, if we're better at administering things on the state program, landlords may want to say, well, I don't want to deal with this program, I want to deal with this one, and that won't be good for the overall state. So even though we want to streamline, we do have to take into account some of the HUD rules so that we maintain that consistency just so that we can be as effective as we can be in using every single voucher. So maybe we don't want to be so effective on one and not on the other. So we really want to move in tandem. But clearly there are ways to make things a little bit more effective, more efficient. And that is something that we're going to be diving into over the next year or two and really see what we can add, subtract to make the process go a little bit quicker. So for MRVP um, specifically, we do a lot of project-based vouchers. We work with a lot of owners. Some of those project-based vouchers come with supportive subsidies and will target clients of some of our sister agencies. Um, all of those waiting lists are with the owner and a lot of those ownership entities or service providers um, are deeply committed to various populations that they serve. For our mobile vouchers though, one of the ways we've tried to maintain some efficiency is We'll do targeted issuances, but upon turnover, all of our vouchers are just regular vouchers and they go to a waiting list. We have found that trying to maintain small pocket programs within a much larger voucher program is, is difficult over time. Um, MRVP has been around for decades. Um, and so relying on our homeless priorities and centralizing the application and the verification process for those as much as possible um, is what we're really, really trying to do. And then to the extent that we need to target specific populations, a lot of that happens through our project-based vouchers. And then we have a couple smaller voucher programs that are specifically aimed to different populations. Um, but again, just having vouchers available to the folks who need it where the only big eligibility criteria is below 80% AMI. Thank you. I could ask questions all day, but I think I'd like to open it up to the audience, so that way I'm sure there's a lot that uh, they want to learn from you all. So I'm going to open it up to the audience um, for a couple of questions for our panel. Now is the time, before we get into the policy side, let's pick their brains and then we can talk about policy strategies. I'm going to steal your microphone. Oh, excellent. Good. Thank you. For the Massachusetts program, you said you're moving to the small area of fair market rents, and I just wanted to know if you guys anticipate that, that will, will that raise the average cost per voucher? And also uh, for the centralized uh, applications, it, will that, is that only for your state program, or does that also include the Section 8 vouchers? Yeah, so our division of rental assistance at the state level, we are also a PHA with HUD and we're a moving to work agency. So we have 22,000 Section 8 vouchers that are administered by some of our regional partners. Um, on March 1st, those Section 8 vouchers are going to 120% small area FMR for the payment standard and our MRVPs with a much lower budget are going to 110% small area FMR. Straight small area FMR not doing the higher of large area and small area. Um, based on what we've been able to predict, which is really hard because you don't sort of know where people are going to move and how long that's going to take, um, we think it'll be relatively cost neutral. There might be a slight increase, but overall we definitely think that it's worth it. Um, and then our online waiting list, which you can find at mass.gov slash champ, um, you can all apply and send any of your feedback. Um, that right now is for our state-aided public housing, which is 44,000 housing units, um, MRVP, and then also a small voucher program for non-elderly disabled adults. I believe we are trying to get our federal vouchers onto an online system, but it is not going to be that CHAMP system. Our homeless priorities are very complicated, and wait lists are surprisingly complicated as well. Um, Hi, um, Larice Harvey again from West Carceray Anonymous. This question is to you because you live in Connecticut and you're in control of that. So um, this legislative se session, um, we want to advocate to remove the question, have you ever been convicted um, of felony from all housing applications, you know, i.e. being the box on housing, because there's only two questions legally that should be asked on the applications. 
Given that 10% of Connecticut's population is just as impacted, i.e. have a felony or a criminal conviction, are you planning on expanding the RAP program beyond just probation and want to partner with Once Incarcerated Anonymous to help others who either um, been home and found themselves homeless or um, sleeping on someone's couch but can't get the apartment because they don't make enough money for that apartment. And then are you willing to work with us to work with um, private um, housing properties to accept vouchers? Because I've, for the last two years, been working with Section 8 um, individuals in Connecticut and been rejected by public housing authority partners and private partners, but they get in the tax breaks to develop, but not housing our people. So what are you going to do about that? Um, all of you can answer that on any level. But my question is really for, I'm a justice impacted individual. I've been home for 25 years almost, and I've given back to my community more than anybody who's probably never committed a crime. But yet I don't have the same civil liberties. I don't even have the same disability rights for housing as someone without a conviction. And I think it's time, because we are the mass population that is homeless and um, discriminated against based on color and background. So I wanna know if you wanna partner with me to get some stuff done and get some of those Section 8 vouchers expanded to those directly impacted who are not probation, but maybe parole or been home for a while. Sure, so uh, I, I do like to partner. Uh, so certainly we'd be willing to hear you out. Uh, just a couple things on, on our state program. Yes, we do have some of those questions that go onto the application. However, uh, when you look at, we are looking at these different specialty populations, whether it's homeless, whether it's DCF, whether it's uh, MFP, all these different ones. And one thing that Michelle in the back does a great job of is, even though those questions may be on there, we just say, hey, are you working with anybody? And we know the answer to that is yes, because all these programs come with case management. So what we end up doing is we have the individual that is applying for the rental assistance combined with their caseworker and say, hey, this is the plan, this is what we're gonna do, and then we always say, okay, fine. We're willing to give you a chance. There are a couple exceptions to that. We all know the sex offender list is, becomes really difficult, mm -hmm. and I know that there's legislation out there too, and if you're successful in the advocacy, of course we're gonna follow the law. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that, that can go on it. In terms of accessing housing we have the same exact problem that you do so we do not own any public housing in the state of Connecticut you know the local public housing authorities do but for the individuals that we're trying to serve it's almost impossible to find units too so we do try to hire have our partners hire um, housing navigators so if you have any idea on how to crack that nut I'm definitely willing to, to, to listen because it's not the easiest thing right now in the world is to find available units uh, so we certainly are interested in a lot of these things we do want to once again streamline we want to be tried to be as fair and equitable as possible so I think we've made some certain strides and once again we're much more willing to take those chances on the state funded side as opposed to the federally funded side but that doesn't mean that we can't have those conversations on the on the section 8 program as well hi good morning um, so at the beginning um, dr. Hanks mentioned how great the FSS program is with um, obviously federal funded housing choice vouchers and the availability for families who get a voucher to help save so I'm curious if any of the state programs if you guys have anything similar to the family self-sufficiency fund so that when someone receives a voucher they're also able to save a portion of that income and maybe eventually um, live somewhere without a voucher or attain home ownership so if anyone could speak to that that'd be great So we are in the process. Um, there is some legislation moving through the le legislature, and also we have some discretion within you know, our own program to institute within the state program a home ownership program and a family self-sufficiency program modeled after what we do in Section 8. I think that FSS is really a key part of making home ownership successful. For voucher holders, I think those really marry very well together. And I think that the um, home ownership program within the voucher program is really an amazing and underutilized program 
So in addition to looking to institute it in that state program, we are also in the process of hiring some additional staff to help us um, turbocharge our Section 8 uh, home, home ownership and FSS program, and then also hopefully in the very near future, uh, turbocharge that in the state programs as well. Yeah, and in Massachusetts, we have a state self-sufficiency program that is nearly identical to FSS. We do that in conjunction with state public housing, um, and all of our agencies have exceeded their enrollment goals, so that is very exciting. Um, previously, we would do similar programs on kind of like five-year cycles, and we would do like a five-year pilot, and then it would end, and then we would do another five-year pilot, but it would kind of be the exact same program. Um, so I am hopeful that this iteration of the state self-sufficiency program, we can keep going just to give more continuity to those families and also so that agencies can continue to enroll folks um, as they are starting to graduate with their escrows. Um, I think over the summer we had three public housing folks who graduated and moved into home ownership. So very exciting. Um, Jenny Monk, Connecticut Mirror. Uh, this is sort of a, a two-part question about the, the need for affordable housing and, and these types of vouchers. First, you, you all talked about um, opening up the waiting list so that folks can not get the voucher, right, but get on the waiting list to get the voucher. It, I mean, it seems that the, the waiting list is sort of a test to the amount of need. So given that, what, what is the thinking behind limiting the number of people on the waiting list? Uh, and Steve, how many more millions are you going to need to maintain the Connecticut's RAP program? I mean, I can speak to how we handle our waiting list. And really, part of that is the, we want when people come up on the waiting list, we want to be able to find them. We want to be able to house them quickly. What we found is that when the waiting list grows past a certain point, we are spending a lot of money in just trying to find those people on the waiting list and send them a note that's like, do you still want to be on the waiting list? Are you still in the same place? And so we are, that is not a useful amount of money. I think the other thing is that, um, that we find too is when we, we want to get people as quickly as possible, we want our utilization rate to be as close to 100% at all times as it can. So we need to be able to find you right away. I think the other thing is also, I mean, just speaks to me more philosophically, which is as I go around the state and I talk to a lot of people about housing and about the waiting list, people say to me a lot, they're, they're like, it's a waiting list, the waiting list are waiting list to nowhere. You never, nobody ever gets off a waiting list. You know, so why apply? Why do this? It's, it's hopeless. And so it is really useful to be able to say, that's no, that's actually not the case. You will be served if you are on this waiting list within this amount of time. If you come on, you're going to get a voucher. And it's not going to be, you know, 10 years from now. It's not going to be 15 years from now. So it is, I mean, it's hard. On the one hand, people will say, like, well, you know, but I could get on the waiting list and then in 20 years you could serve me. And that's true too. So it's, I mean, really though, for all the discussions about it, the real problem is we do not have enough money mm -hmm. to serve everyone. Like we are talking, we are, we are, argu no, I mean, not, you're not arguing with me, I know. But, we, you know, in, when, when people do, and they do, um, we are arguing about, you know, it's, all, it's like arguing about how to like better distribute the crumbs. Yeah. And I think... You know, for all of that talk, when we're talking about, like, is it better to do the waiting list this way or that way or this year or that year or this way, really, you know, I think it's important not to lose sight of what the real issue that we have to solve is, which is how do we get to a place where we don't have to have waiting lists for things as basic to people as housing? And I think that's, yeah, we got to run these things the best way we can. We got to run them the best way we can. Like, you know, in a lot of ways, my job is managing scarcity, which is both, you know, a super depressing thing to say, but also it's really important how you manage that scarcity, right? Like, you got to do it the best way you can. But I think it's really important to always remember when we're talking about this, that's what we're talking about. And we've got to get to where we can, you know, get to a place of, you know, it would be great. Abund I would take abundance, but even before abundance, I take of just enough. Um, I will say, even though our waiting lists are open since September and they will remain open and the, the number just keeps growing, 
Um, at least folks can apply. Uh, that said, we do spend a lot of time thinking about how to communicate to applicants and constituents when they reach out to us that it is a wait and it is an unknown wait and it is a very long wait and we cannot solve their immediate need, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think we subscribe to the same idea of not having an insanely long wait list. I think the last time we put out our Section 8 list, you know, we were able to move through through a five, six year period. So agreed, even that is too long. So I think we do try to be as um, thoughtful about that because it does take a lot of work to track people down because these are housing unstable people, so they're, they're going to move a lot. Yep. So trying to figure out, okay, send letters to them every year. And I think it's also unfair that if we don't get that forwarding address, they come off the wait list. So, you know, trying to keep that number a little bit smaller uh, is certainly uh, important to us because I think that affects the efficiency that we were all talking about and making sure that we serve people. So I think it's worth our while to open up the wait list a little bit more often uh, and keep the number low so that we keep that list as robust and fresh as possible. Now in terms of your other question, um, the state has never removed anybody from uh, any of our rental assistance programs. So I, I don't envision that. So I'm pretty sure that the administration will be able to, to work with that in terms of expanding it. That's a conversation for the appropriators because uh, th those are the ones that give us the funds to be able to manage these programs. I'll also point out that our online waiting list emails folks every time we send them a letter for that very reason because their addresses change all the time. At least they get an email. For folks who don't have a stable address or an email, I don't really know what to do with that. Um, and we're also trying to work on being able to text applicants as well because the number one reason why people get removed is because you can't find them and it's just heartbreaking when they call three years later. I will say I think the text is really important. We started implementing, when we were doing the, e, the ERA program, we started implementing the text and now we're doing that for everybody because people just use it more. Uh, you were saying, sorry, Abigail Brown, Connecticut Public. Um, you were saying that it kind of comes down to money and that you're working with crumbs. Um, but another thing that, Steve, you've been mentioning is the lack of units. So is it, uh, which do you think is more important, getting funding or getting house, like actual units? Or is that kind of one and the same because you can, of course, use the money to, to build units? Oh, I totally agree it's one and the same because um, there's, there's two different ways to look at it. You need to build as many units as possible. I think, Chelsea, you had up on your chart the number or even maybe the low, National Loan Housing Tax. So no, I always say tax rate because um, that's what I think of when I think when you put income and tax together. Uh, but you, you see the, the lack of affordable housing here in the state of Connecticut. And I know DOH is certainly really invested in using state bond funds and other federal funds to build as many units of affordable housing as possible. But at the same time, we also know that it takes a while to, to get developments to be built. There's a lot of reasons, whether it is supply shortages, whether it's zoning, whether it's just some of the stuff with environmental that we have to go through. It takes a while. So in order to have a really balanced approach to be able to um, resolve this problem, you have to attack it from both sides. You need to be able to increase the supply, but at the same time, you need to be able to leverage the units that are out there. So in order to leverage those units, that, that's where we need the rental assistance funds. And then hopefully as we catch up by building more and more and more units, we'll get to that point where we're trying to get to that equal equilibrium where we have enough affordable housing. We know we're not there yet. We know it's a long way away, but I think that's what panels like this and other panels of the partnership put on about building affordable housing really highlights the need to be able to go ahead and continue to do that. For Massachusetts, I think our project-based vouchers are so important because our division of housing development that does the tax credits and the bond funds and builds thousands of units a year can leverage those project-based vouchers to create more affordable units, more deeply affordable units, and help make the budgets for those projects work better. Um, it also, especially in higher opportunity neighborhoods, creates permanent units there for some of our folks who are disabled, especially having accessible units that have a project-based voucher attached is hugely beneficial. Um, and so trying to leverage those resources to create net new units, because even if we had money to give a voucher to everyone, there aren't units that would pass inspection available to all of those folks. Yeah, I agree. I mean, everything all at once is what we need. 
Um, something I'm really excited about in New Jersey that we just uh, signed the MOU for is our state Medicaid agency has $100 million in Medicaid savings that they're able to um, have us administer to create new affordable housing units, so it's a construction, a building fund. At the same time, we are gonna take about 35 million in state funds to create a capitalized operating reserve for those, um, for those units so that all of the units will serve Medicaid participants who make 20% or less of AMI. We would not be able to serve that many folks at that low of an income level, like people just can't build projects that um, pencil out without being able to bring that, the, that kind of operating money in some way. So essentially by putting up that money in state money, we leverage $100 million to create new housing because you need both of those things, especially if you're gonna house people who are at the lowest affordability level. So, you know, we need everything. Amazing. Thank you, panel. Will you all join us in thanking our panel from Massachusetts, New Jersey, and our own Connecticut? Thanks, guys. And we're finally going to give you that promised five-minute break. So uh, we'll come back here really in five minutes because we're, we're beating the clock here uh, for our last discussion of the morning. So please refresh your coffee, use the restroom, and we'll see you back here uh, at 1149. <laughs> All right, everyone, if you could please take your seats and um, exchange your information, maybe catch up after our last panel finishes. Um, thank you so much for coming. As you all heard during the last presentation, these state-funded rental vouchers are a powerful tool in our key, in our powerful tool in our toolbox for housing, um, but the demand far, far outstrips the current supply. Um, last year, a coalition of housing advocates in Massachusetts released a report, a right to rental assistance in Massachusetts, that explores the question, what if we fully funded a voucher system to meet the current eligibility standards? So we invited the report's authors to come talk to us today about their paper. I'd like to introduce Chris Norris, the Executive Director of Metro Housing Boston, who will talk a little bit about the history of Massachusetts State Rental Voucher Program. Um, Evan Horowitz, the Executive Director for the Center for State Policy Analysis at Tufts University, who will go over, was the lead author on the report, and will go over some of the key findings and highlights about what a universal voucher system could look like. And Helen Murphy, the Program Manager of Neighborhoods and Housing at the Boston Foundation, who will talk through some of the current advocacy efforts in Massachusetts um, in the past year since the report has been released towards this eventual goal. We believe that their insights on this process in a neighboring state with a similar program can provide useful lessons and insights for what a strategy or policy um, could look like in Connecticut for our own rental voucher programs. So we want to thank you and welcome you. So we have a couple more minutes that I can still say good morning. So good morning, everyone. And I want to thank um, Chelsea and Ashley and the partnership as a whole for inviting me to speak this morning. As a policy wonk from my beginning days in the field, it is nice to be able to step back from programs for a little while and actually talk about policy. So um, thank you for that. And I think I have about five minutes to cover 60 years of history. So this is gonna be really quick. If I sound like an auctioneer at some point, just wave like this and um, I'll slow down. But um, seriously, Massachusetts started their state voucher program in 1966. Um, it came out of a commission that had been created by the governor the year before, came up with numerous different um, housing recommendations, and one of them was a state, a state voucher program, which became known as the 707 program. And it moved along swimmingly, and by 1990, it was serving 20,000 families across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And then we had a new governor elected, and we had some new leadership in the legislature, and we had the bottom fallout of the economy around the same time. And by 1991, they stopped 
allowing for the reissuance of vouchers. And from there, we saw the slow, steady decline in the number of families being served. So that you know, by um, you know, early two, 2000s, we were down to 5,000 families that were being served. And not surprisingly, the number of homeless families went the opposite direction, but it took a while for policymakers to determine that there might be a correlation between 15,000 fewer vouchers and an increase in families who are homeless. Um, but they did, and um, you know, by 2012, we actually saw the legislature amend the state budget, and I think that is something um, to point out here, and um, Helen might talk a little bit about um, one of the things that we're working on, the original program was codified. So they actually had to pass a law, get it through both branches of the legislature, get it signed by the governor to change the 707 program, which was what it was originally called. Right now, our state voucher program is a creature of statute. I mean, sorry, not a creature, a creature of the budget. So every year, we run into the um, fun, if you will, and the budget season started last week when the governor released her budget for FY25, is we're constantly reinventing the program. And on one side, it's great because the state has flexibility. You heard about the nimbleness and the ability to do things. On the other hand, it's not predictable. And if nothing else, at least on the project-based side, developers really prefer predictability and consistency not to know that the program's likely to change every year depending on the whims of the legislature. So um, we were able to begin reissuing vouchers um, on or in or around 2012. We're now back up, as Cecilia said, to about 10,000 families that are being served by the state voucher program. Program was at roughly $180 million this year. The governor has proposed an increase to 219 million for the next fiscal year. Um, if we get to that point and you want to, we can always talk about the impact of vouchers and the issue that is front page daily in the news in Massachusetts and in many other states right now around homelessness, particularly family homelessness, and the, how those are being used. But um, suffice it to say, this program has been on a growth trajectory, and that's really what took us to wanting to do this report. And the door opened in 2021 when the state Senate established a committee that they called Reimagining Massachusetts's Post-Pandemic Resiliency. A lot of words, but they used it as an opportunity to go through and look at different issues during the pandemic and where they might want to go after that. And in a very tiny few sentences in the report, they said, quote, rental assistance for everyone that needs it with a carefully designed system allowing families that qualify for rental vouchers to receive support. And a few of us said, hey, this is something we might be able to use. We might be able to jump off of this and go somewhere with it. And um, we tried and pretty much had our heads handed to us really quickly when they said, well, how much will it cost? And we had to say, well, more than you're spending now. That wasn't enough. That wasn't what the legislature wanted. And so um, my board is um, willing to indulge me at times and let us do policy work in addition to our programs. And so we reached out to Evan and the team at Tufts and we put together a small coalition of five different groups that came together, public housing, um, one of the quasi-publics that we have in the state, as well as the Boston Foundation, my organization, and the statewide regional housing network that are those eight regional organizations that administer vouchers on behalf of the state. And between May and December, Evan and his very patient way of working with five groups that were giving him edits and suggestions and comments all the time, um, developed a report. And we finally had a number that we could then go back to the legislature with. And um, Evan will give the details of the report itself, but um, you can imagine that it is a large number. And as expected, there was pushback. Um, but Evan, I know, referenced it in the report, and he may talk about it here. It's not out of the realm of possibility. And I think you know, if I'm on the soapbox for a minute or two, I think at times we as housing advocates tend to settle for crumbs or tend to sell ourselves short, but nothing stops the state senator from calling for you know, 
universal college. The healthcare advocates don't hesitate to ask for universal health care. The um, child care folks don't hesitate to ask for universal pre-K, and yet somehow when housers ask for universal housing assistance because you have 100,000 families on a wait list and you only have 10,000 vouchers, somehow we're asking for the moon. So we're not there. It's going to be slow and steady, and Helen's going to talk about that part and where we're going. And so with that, I will turn it over to Evan to talk about the report, and then Helen to talk about where we go from here. Thanks, Chris. Um, I was thinking about a similar, you know, what's the best example of a let's push for universal big picture thing that, that succeeded? Um, I, I was wondering if maybe um, healthcare insurance rates is a good example. I mean, there was a time 20 years ago, uh, the size of the uninsured population was like 20, 30 percent of the full population. It had really high uninsurance rates. And at the time, the state had all kinds of little pilot programs. How do we address this group of uninsured people and that group of uninsured people? And like you try to hold it together until there was a decision, we don't need these, we just mandate insurance coverage and provide subsidies to, to everyone who needs a subsidy, and then you end up with everybody having insurance. And we haven't gotten to 100%, but in Massachusetts, I believe we're at 98% um, instead of 75 or 80%. Like, it, it does happen sometimes that programs that are built on uh, hacks for a while turn into effective universal programs. Anyway, into this. So first, a little bit about the organization that I run uh, be th this month, our four-year anniversary. Um, we do nonpartisan analysis of live policy issues in Massachusetts across a, a huge range of issues, not just housing, but tax policy, transportation policy, um, child care, uh, environmental justice. And the idea is to give lawmakers information they need to improve their legislation. We don't have a dedicated research service in the legislature. Um, to help citizens understand ballot questions and to help advocates with issues they care about. We started this project by thinking about the benefits, the known benefits, the research established benefits of vouchers. And they include things that you'd expect and some things you don't expect. I think the, the expected things, poverty alleviation, right? If you're giving someone uh, a voucher, you are eliminating the need to pay rent or at least to contribute as much to rent as you would otherwise have to contribute to rent. Right? This is the largest part in basically every household budget is housing costs. Um, you alleviate that, you free up room, and so you end up reducing poverty. And homelessness, the same kind of direct impact. You're helping people afford a place to live. Um, that reduces homelessness. Health outcomes, though, are also strongly affected by the availability of vouchers. And partly this is uh, kind of life stability, partly it's uh, stress. Um, the stress of uncertainty um, around your ability to pay and your uh, domicile status is intense and produces really real physical and mental health challenges which are reduced with vouchers. Um, stability in the housing, in the affordable housing market. Uh, and this comes in a variety of ways. Part of it is that uh, vouchers, some landlords appreciate the reliability of vouchers. That is you know that you're going to get paid by the state if you have a tenant who is in this program. So it is a reliable income stream in the way that would be otherwise, might otherwise be challenging to lease or rent to uh, lower income people. Um, but the bigger thing is that you don't have to fight with developers about the number of affordable units in new projects. You can let developers build for the market and then let the vouchers make the market rate apartments affordable to those who need it, right? The vouchers do all of the affordability work and the developers don't have to do as much. I'm not suggesting this is the only solution, I'm suggesting it is one of the very positive solutions uh, attached to vouchers as compared to, say, rent control, where, yes, you achieve affordability aims, but you also reduce incentives to build and limit construction. And then there's mobility. For not the project-based, but the mobile-based vouchers, this is an opportunity for people to move. Now, some people love their communities. In that case, it's an opportunity to stay in their neighborhoods. But if they don't and they want to move, they can. Um, Chris gave some background on MRVP, our program, so I won't talk too much about it. Uh, people know how it works. Um, we have, I have 9,000 here, but sort of 10,000 roughly now. But we're very 
austere limitations on the current system. The majority of people, it says legible, but it should say eligible, for MRVP don't get vouchers, right? It's not like a small share who are eligible don't get it. The majority of those who are eligible don't get it. There are real challenges of landlord discrimination. Um, in Massachusetts, and I assume elsewhere, we have real challenges of organizational uh, inefficiency. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, there are somewhere around 100 agencies that are overseeing these programs. Uh, they, do not, they often do not share data. It is hard to collect information about it. It is hard to um, distribute responsibility across a system like that. Um, these are all challenges, I think, that we have in Massachusetts that are not unique to Massachusetts. So a universal program, if you move to a universal program, and by a universal program we mean if you're eligible, you get a voucher. We just check your eligibility uh, on the income side and the asset side. If you're eligible, you get a voucher, okay? If you move to a program like that, and that's how, you know, lots of government programs work that way. Social Security works that way, right? You, you pay in, you have eligibility, you get it. It's not like, oh, people paid in, but this year we only have $100 million to pay out, so we'll see who gets their Social Security payouts um, or Medicare. Oh, we only have a certain amount of money for Medicare, so we'll see who gets coverage this year. Right? It doesn't work that way. If you're eligible, you get the program. MRVP or housing vouchers could work the same way. And if they did, you would spread the benefits to many, many more seniors, families, individuals with low incomes. You eliminate the unfairness of the lottery and the wait list. You reduce landlord discrimination because you create a big market. If instead of 9,000 vouchers or 20,000 vouchers, you have 200,000 vouchers, that's a market opportunity for landlords and builders. Right? You can rely on this stream. You can build for this stream. And if you are discriminating, you're losing a huge swath of potential uh, tenants if there are 200 or 300,000 vouchers. And I mentioned the new incentives for construction that way because you have a market for it. So we have numbers, and I'll start talking about numbers for Massachusetts. I think if you, if you have Connecticut in mind, you probably should just cut these numbers in half. Right? Like the, the population of Connecticut is about half the size of the population of Massachusetts. And the rough distribution of wealth and income is similar. Um, that is, we are both very high income states um, with problems of inequality. Uh, so given that, I think if you want to apply any of the numbers I'm about to say to the Connecticut case, probably cut them in half. Not the percentages, right? The percentages are the same, um, but the raws. So we found there are about 585,000 households in Massachusetts that meet the current eligibility criteria for MRVP rental assistance and could be eligible for a universal program. That's out of, in Massachusetts, a population of just under three million, two and a half million households. So kind of one in five-ish households. Um, if you offer vouchers to all of those, you have the benefits we were talking about, plus kind of racial justice and economic justice uh, advancements, regional fairness, um, that is urban and rural parts of the state, and caring for seniors. I'll, I'll, we can talk at length. The report talks more about those. I'll just mention the, the racial justice implications. What the chart is showing is the number of black and Hispanic families that are eligible for MRVP, that meet the eligibility criteria. It's roughly or over half. Um, so you have a disproportionate benefit in those communities. But the costs are not small for 585,000 households. Um, here's how we did the cost estimate. So we found all the households, as I say, about 585,000. We adjust for existing programs, because the state has, and the federal government, have a number of programs, everything from public housing to existing voucher programs to subsidized departments. And those programs reach about 335,000 people currently. Um, then you want to make another adjustment for incomplete participation. So even the best-run government programs don't reach 100% of eligible people. SNAP doesn't reach 100% of eligible recipients. Um, if you run it really well, you can get to 85, 90%. Um, if you run it really poorly, you end up at 50, 60%, something like that. Um, so we assume a well-run program here, uh, 85, 90% participation. There's also churn. Right? Some people are leaving at any one time. Some people are coming in and haven't been here long enough. Um, that reduces it further to about 240,000. And then you calculate the average cost for a new voucher. Um, which we, we did by looking at the current costs. Um, this is as of last year. Um, it's about $1,000 a month, plus administrative costs, which are not well covered in the current um, approach. Um, we figure about 10% for administrative costs. And here again, this is not based on current administrative spending, which is too low. 
um, but on administrative costs of effective similar federal and state programs around the country, which tend to be in the 10% range. Um, so all to, putting it all together, we conclude that a universal rental assistance program would help about 240,000 new households in Massachusetts at an annual cost of $3.2 billion. Again, if you're thinking Connecticut, I would just cut those numbers in half. Um, to give a, a better sense of scale of what $3.2 billion means, and Chris mentioned this, uh, other large-scale proposals for universal programs in the state are in this range. When people talk about universal child care, the estimates we have are 2 to $5 billion a year. Um, so $3.2 billion is a large number, but it is large in the way that other uh, aggressive advocacy demands are large and not in the way that moonshot impossible uh, demands are large. Getting there is tricky, not just politically. I'm not even going to talk about the politics of getting there. Uh, I talk about the economics and the policy challenges. One thing would be keeping rents in check. If tomorrow uh, Massachusetts or Connecticut decided to make vouchers available to all eligible people to spend $3 billion on that, um, most of the benefits would actually be captured by landlords. Um, we don't have enough housing. Rents would go up, and go up a lot, and the cost of the program would go up a lot. So. There's no way to make this work that doesn't involve uh, significant new construction. Another challenge, ensuring access to jobs. You want to really be careful about uh, setting up cliffs here. If the program is extremely valuable, you make it so valuable that people are terrified of not being eligible, so they turn down good work opportunities or promotions, things like that. So you have to, this is, this is a very manageable thing to do, by the way. You just have to be careful about how you manage it. Right? It's got to phase out. And this is one reason why using 80% of area median income instead of 30% is really, really important. If you have 30% cutoffs, then the people who hit 35% hit or 40% are still very low income and at severe risk if they're not eligible for the program. If you're at 80% and you get to 85%, you're in a much healthier economic situation to find a place to live. Um, and then minimizing competition with federal programs. That is, you don't want to create a program where you end up losing Section 8 dollars because uh, your state program's better and covering everybody. So you just have to be careful to follow those limitations. Um, so again, that means moving in phases. You know, we had talked about maybe a 10-year plan, uh, 10,000 additional vouchers a year for 10 years or 12,000 additional a year for 10 years. Uh, reorganization of the, you know, 100-ish um, entities that oversee the program and substantial incentives for new construction. And I, I'll, I'll repeat here, one of the nice things about voucher program is that it doesn't impede incentives for new construction. It actually dovetails with incentives for new construction because you're creating a new a market, a uh, solid market for landlords. Um, I'll stop there. All right, I think I can officially say good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, Thank you so much to the partnership for hosting us, although I will add my vote that next year should be in Hawaii, <laughs> weather permitting. Um, my name is Helen. I work at the Boston Foundation, and we are currently the um, facilitator for the MRVP coalition. So uh, this is a coalition that's been reinvigorated since the release of this amazing report, but it stands on the shoulders of work that's been going on since the, since the inception of the program to increase the um, budget amount every year and to put more vouchers out into circulation. So I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> our current work, but I just want to honor that we did not start a year ago. We are very, um, uh, we have benefited greatly from advocates like Chris and advocates that are still at the table uh, championing voucher holders and championing this program. So uh, in terms of uh, $3.2 billion, as Evan said, we're not going to get there tomorrow. Um, and so it's been really important with this group to establish some intermediary goals to improve the program over time to move us towards um, an entitlement style or uh, entitlement formatted program. 
And so in terms of when this group came together, there's a couple values that sort of rose to the top that I can, I can share. Um, one of the items that's been really exciting is that this uh, coalition is a group of partners that are not all sort of seated in the same position in the housing ecosystem. We've really benefited from uh, advocates who work a lot with seniors, who work with the disability community, who are housing providers, who work in the Massachusetts budget process, um, as well, I can keep going on, but I, I won't give you the whole list. And so having sort of unlikely partners at the table has really strengthened our ask and our advocacy uh, over the past year. In addition to that, um, what we've heard loud and clear, both from previous advocacy for this program and coming to um, the present and future, is the centering of lived experience in everything that we do, uh, especially as it relates to the legislature. So um, one of the greatest champions of this work uh, through the years is an organization that has lifted up lived experience, folks who use vouchers or folks who have um, not been able to access them, uh, so that whatever we, whatever stories we're telling, they're coming directly from uh, folks who are living that experience every day. So those are two of the kind of really special items about the coalition. In terms of our goals, uh, one of our first goals is, uh, or the first one I'll talk about anyways, is uh, the codification of the MRVP program. So Chris mentioned this a little bit. Shocking to say that a 220, well, I guess the new budget, but $180 million program is not codified in state statute. Um, it, the, the purpose for us um, championing some this codification effort is not that we think that tomorrow uh, we're going to get an administration that will slice it right out of the budget, although should knock on all the wood. <laughs> um, but it's more uh, that there's uh, a safety in that, in that it's um, always going to be there. It is uh, protected in the statute. Uh, it will, you know, uh, through stormy uh, seas, it will prevail. Uh, Chris mentioned that we don't know, you know, what could happen down the line in the economy, and so it's really beneficial to know that that program will be protected. There's also an opportunity in codification to bring it a little closer to the Section 8 program, and as Steve was talking about in the last panel, that's, that can be beneficial the closer those are to each other. We don't have a dis, uh, an imbalance in... Um, uh, interest in either program and, and they become more efficient when they're a little bit closer as well. Uh, so those are kind of the purposes for codification. It is an important needle to thread though because you know when we talk about this one of the things that we can hear is okay the house is on fire though you know like we're in the housing crisis so great that you want to codify it can't we talk about that when we don't have you know a hundred thousand person waiting list but it's really important that we um, one of the things that the advocates have uh, in the coalition have identified is that we need to talk about expanding the budget of the program and getting new vouchers on the street in tandem with the codification because it benefits the program just the way that we talk about um, expanding the budget and getting more vouchers out in the same breath as talking about data collection and getting a better sense of who's using the program and um, celebrating wins like the online platform for uh, the voucher program so that we can glean better data. So the, the goals of the um, coalition are really thoughtful in that, and these are, I don't take credit for these, these come directly from the group, um, but are not just focused on expanding that budget, but also kind of the uh, pieces that uh, expand beyond just the number of vouchers, the more efficient uh, usage of it, uh, better data collection, more transparency so we know where they're going and where there might be pockets of um, inefficiency. Uh, and those items that kind of walk alongside the, the number of vouchers directly can get to some of the items um, Evan was talking about and some of the hurdles. Um, so I can pause there and I, will, I won't keep rambling, but really appreciate the partnership and thrilled to be on the stage with uh, both of these gentlemen and all the work that they've done to champion MRVP. Thank you so much. And we do have time for some questions. I'm, I'm gonna start, so, and then, so <laughs> take privilege. Uh, so one of my questions was, was first, uh, and not a, t not a tax expert, uh, but um, in terms of cost, 
uh, the, the mortgage interest ta uh, deduction. And, um, and I'm not sure how that impacts state revenues exactly, uh, but do you, do you have a sense of how universal, uh, the cost of universal vouchers relates to the cost of the mortgage interest deduction? That's a great question. I do not know offhand the size and scale of the impact of the mortgage interest deduction, um, but it's a good it's a good comparator, and I'm going to go look it up and add it to this presentation afterwards because that's a really good idea. Oh, great, thank you, and I, we can talk more about that. So my second question, then I promise I'll pass the microphone around, is how is this is exciting, and I think some of what I heard from all of you is it seems to change the conversation. Um, you know, talking about the changes that would happen in the, in the marketplace, uh, the changes around, the ideas around like forcing inclusionary zoning, let's say, you know, private developers. Like, how much has this changed the conversation in Massachusetts? How much do you anticipate it to change the conversation in Massachusetts? I, I guess this one's coming to me since both microphones are headed this way. Um, I don't, you know, being honest, I don't know if it has changed the conversation on its own. Uh, ah, there we go. Okay. Um, I don't know if it alone has changed the conversation. I think the benefit is it's now part of the conversation. And I say that um, in part because what's driving the conversation right now is family homelessness and the fact that Massachusetts as a at least up till recently, a right to shelter state for families and that if you were eligible, you got housed in shelter until it was capped at 7,500 families recently and now they have a 600 family wait list and they're opening overflow shelters. Um, that's what's driving the conversation. The fact that the state has made 1,200 vouchers available because they recognize that vouchers are part of the answer to this, I think is in our favor. So we're part of the conversation. They have the number. They have codification in front of them as an option. The governor proposed a 40, what, a $40 million increase to the line item. You, we usually have to beg for things like that. So I think it's just there. It's sort of like a wait to be able to um, move it further. So. Good, thank you. Other questions? No. Yeah, I know. I'll just keep going. Jonathan, you don't have one? <laughs> Anything that the panel wants to share before? Oh, Patrick. I'll ask a question just to keep the conversation Thanks, going. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been fascinated by, you know, why some programs have universal eligibility and some programs don't. And, it, you know, it just seems bizarre that we would, you know, cap something that is so kind of fundamental. I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, subsidized housing and there's lots of people who aren't fan of subsidized housing. Um, but there isn't a lot of conversation about what I understand, and maybe you could talk about this, the, the largest federal subsidized housing program is the mortgage income deduction, which you know every homeowner kind of benefits from, whether they're low income or very high income. And so I'm curious if you've done any analysis about you know, what changes could be made in that subsidized housing program that funds middle and high income um, homeowners to fund um, you know, what's much more needed at the kind of low income end of things. Thanks. It's funny you think that's a data question I was going to answer with politics, uh, which is that nothing can be done about the mortgage interest tax deduction. It is probably the most popular tax deduction in the tax code, unfortunately. Um, so it's the kind of thing that wonks like me might rail against, but homeowners adore and the homeownership rate in this country is, you know, 60 some odd percent. Um, it, I mean, they're still fighting about the salt cap limitations on some of these deductions at the state level and it looks like that's going to get rolled back too even though the, the actual beneficiaries of this are, I mean, so it's like the most regressive 
uh, rollback of any tax policy possible right now, and uh, and it's happening, and it's happening at the behest of blue state members. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, which is all to say, you're right, and I don't see any path forward for um, changing that part of the tax code. However, I do think it's valuable to keep raising it, and it's yeah, I think it's valuable to keep raising it and pointing out that it is a subsidy because if people don't think of it that way; they think of it um, as a, their natural right, uh, which of course it isn't. I do have a question, sorry. I stepped out, so you may have talked about this, but in Massachusetts, has there been any conversation about, instead of a voucher, a direct rental, like cash to the, the tenant instead of a voucher? I know HUD is looking to partner with a number of organizations across the country to pilot direct rental assistance to tenants versus using a voucher, trying to essentially take the landlord out of potentially discriminating against um, tenants and also the ability for potentially having cash be, have the household be a bit more mobile because then they can move into uh, units that may not, have not been open to them in the past. So I um, wonder if that conversation has happened in Massachusetts or any other state uh, when it comes to the state program. Okay, sure. I know of at least the Cambridge Foundation and the city of Chelsea have both run similar programs and as far as I know, they're seeing good results from them, which isn't necessarily a surprise. Recently, Jamie Dimon argued the same thing, which is if you give people $6,000, you're going to you know, save the other. And if we don't do the um, worker tax credit, anyway, um, you know, or the child tax credit or the others, if you just put it all together and gave people the money, you would save um, more in the long run. But um, it's really in Massachusetts right now. Um. Yeah, I would just say the same thing. I think at the Boston Foundation, we've been able to sort of uh, begin to get into that realm in some small pilots. We produce a food, fuel, and food, fuel, and shelter program fund. And this last year, we committed all the funds to direct cash transfer programs, ones that were already established, Chelsea Eats and other um, programs that have seen really good results, but again, it's really salient information to say that folks want to govern their own finances, and when given the opportunity, they're just as responsible as anybody else. Um, so that's been very encouraging to see, for sure. I guess All right. the comparison I would add is the low-income housing tax credit, because I've we have one in Massachusetts. We have a state low-income housing tax credit. And I remember conversations when we were working to get it passed years ago with Ways and Means staff. And they kept coming, well, wouldn't it be more efficient if you just gave cash instead of the tax credit? And the answer was, yes, are you going to give us the cash? And the answer was, no. And it's like, okay, well, we'll take the tax credit then. Thank you. <laughs> I'm assuming there are no other questions, but could I share a last story? Yeah, go ahead, and okay, I think is... after we're going to have one more question. Oh, there is a question. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off. Do we have one more question? All right, I would go All right, ahead. so this is, this is about uh, the, the power of few words and seeding change. Um, Chris mentioned that the seed for this project was a report by the state senate called the Reimagining Massachusetts, which included this small blurb about the value of a universal rental assistance program. I wrote that blurb. I, Chris and I had never met. We never talked about this, nothing. I happened to be the person uh, hired by the state Senate in that case or my organization to help with that report. Um, and, you know, as part of that, there were, they, I was channeling their favored policies but as the channeler of their favorite policies, I had some latitude to introduce policies that I thought were sound and should be the basis for the future of Massachusetts as, you know, guy who holds the pen. So I put that in and uh, figured that was the end of it, but, you know, was happy about it. And then people noticed it. And it turned into this project and has continued this conversation. So this is just, um, I don't know, for me, I kind of in, it, always post. Always post. It's valuable. You don't know what's going what's gonna to turn into. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to our panel for, for traveling, for coming. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more, um, 
Chris so graciously brought a number of copies of the report that are in the materials table by the elevator. So if you haven't had a chance to grab one of those and are interested in learning more about the, the program, the methodology, pick one up. Um, it's great. It's right next to all of our housing priorities. Um, and as we, as we conclude our session, I just wanted to share with all of you who may be policymakers, who may be advocates in the audience today, um, the partnership is one of our key priorities is advancing housing affordability through preserving, expanding, and improving the state rental assistance program. We're asking to increase the existing appropriation um, from its current funding by $8 million just to keep pace with the current rent increases and make sure that households don't lose these vouchers, that they're not getting taken out of circulation. And then an additional $8 million to expand this program by 10% to an additional 650 more low-income households. Um, and we also always would advocate for improving existing data reporting to better measure both the need and the effectiveness of RAP. Um, so we invite you to work with us as our cross-sectional partners, as our advocates towards these goals with the session kicking off next week. Um, in a couple of weeks from now, on Friday, February 16th at 2 p.m., we'll be having a webinar. There's a legislative session and budget briefing. So we'll be going over the governor's revised budget proposal. We'll be going over what bills are cropping up in the committee this session um, and talking about how they relate to housing and our priorities. Um, so we invite you all to join us for this webinar. And if you can't wait two weeks, next week on Wednesday, February 7th, we are kicking off the very first of our intersectional webinar series. So the first Wednesday of every month in 2024, um, we will be hosting webinars with partners talking about the intersection of housing and all the other policies that it touches, housing and healthcare, housing and race, housing and childcare, housing and education, um, and just providing a foundation for how these are all so related. Um, so we're going to welcome Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments to discuss the intersection of affordable housing and land use. That's next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, and finally, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you did park in the overflow parking um, and you were gonna go up on the hill today or something, just keep in mind that that lot closes and is locked at four. Um, so we don't want anyone's car getting stuck there. Um, additionally, I, I mentioned we have our materials table in the back with the report um, of universal vouchers. We also have our housing priorities laid out for housing affordability, creation, choice, um, and stability. So if you're interested in learning more, we have um, some fact sheets going over our priorities. And finally, da -da -da. I don't think there's anything I missed. If you're not signed up for our newsletter, please join our, our new website that we're, we're kicking off today, tomorrow. Sign up for our newsletter and legislative action alerts that are going out so you can be involved this session. Um, and just thank you for being such a fantastic audience. Thank you to our presenters and our panelists for traveling from so far. Thank you, audience members, for coming and engaging and, and doing your part in this work. Um, we're so grateful to have you all here to be able to gather in person. So thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.